Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to CHK Law. Welcome to today's Greater China Legal History Seminar. It's our great privilege to have today with us Professor Michael Lidwood, who is a professor at the Faculty of Law uh, of the University of Auckland. Professor Littlewood is a New Zealander, but uh, he has spent many years in Hong Kong. He has degrees in law and politics from the University of Auckland and a doctorate in tax from the University of Hong Kong. He's admitted as a barrister and solicitor in New Zealand, as a solicitor in England and Wales, and as a solicitor also in Hong Kong. He is an authority known to many um, on New Zealand tax law, Hong Kong tax law, tax policy, and tax history. Much of his work has been in the fields of tax planning, tax avoidance, and international tax. He is widely published, has widely published uh, in leading law journals, tax law journals. And uh, at the moment, he's a full-time academic, but of course, um, occasionally he is also involved in projects, consultancy projects. Um, Professor Littlewood is, of course, uh, very famous for his book, Taxation Without Representation, the History of Hong Kong's Troubling Successful Tax System, which was first published in 2010. And uh, Professor Littlewood, Littlewood's today's talk on the history of Hong Kong's uh, tax law system will update, update that text, which, um, as everybody knows, uh, has become a bestseller. Before I hand over to Professor Littlewood, can I please announce that um, at the end of this seminar, we will have a Q&A session. If you have any questions, please use the chat function to chat your questions in, which I will then share with Professor Littlewood. Um, without further ado, over to you, Michael. Uh, thank you. First stuff, um, I'd like to thank Lutz for um, inviting me to speak to you today. And I'd like also to thank uh, Connie Lowe for taking care of um, arranging everything. What I'm going to talk about, as Lutz says, is uh, the history of the Hong Kong tax system. Um, I have some slides which I will now um, attempt to get up on the screen. Um, so hopefully, Lutz, you can uh, see, see my slides now. We're, we're, we're there and ready to go. And um, as Lutz says, what I'm going to talk about is uh, the um, history of the Hong Kong tax system. Um, as, as he also mentioned, this talk is going to build quite heavily on uh, my book, um, and I will also update what is in the book. In case you feel like getting yourself a copy, there is a picture of uh, what the book um, looks like. Now, th there are... Uh, three main reasons why you might want to study Hong Kong's tax system. The first one is that the only way you can understand why a tax system is as it is, is by examining how it got to be that way. Second, Hong Kong's tax system has been spectacularly successful. So uh, those of us who live in the rest of the world uh, think that it might be worth looking at the history of Hong Kong's tax system so that we and the rest of the world can find out if there, any, if there is anything that we might be able to learn from it. Most strikingly, obviously, the burden of taxation in Hong Kong is unusually light, and yet the government, generally speaking, operates at a surplus and, as a result, has accumulated very substantial reserves. Of course, the fact that a government that spends relatively little is able to operate on the basis of uh, relatively light taxes is hardly surprising. What is impressive, though, is that Hong Kong people seem more content than other people's, not only with the lightness of the burden, as you might expect, but also, more intriguingly, with the combination of very light taxes and very low public spending. Third reason for examining the history of Hong Kong's tax system is that the history of the tax system sheds useful light on the political process in the territory and perhaps also on the operation of British colonialism generally. <coughs> Commentators on Hong Kong's tax system almost all recognise the obvious fact that um, the territory system of government has always been dominated by business interests and they routinely cite the exceptionally low rates of tax 
as evidence of that dominance. As is well known, standard rate, 15%, the corporate rate, 16.5%, but commentators commonly ignore the fact that the burden of taxation in Hong Kong is generally very much lighter than the rates of tax suggest. The main reason for this is that important categories of income are not taxed at all. Most importantly, there's generally no tax on dividends, there's generally no tax on interest, and there's generally no tax on offshore income. Also, there's no capital gains tax. There are also uh, rules particularly generous relating to deductions, depreciation, and fringe benefits. These, um, these characteristics, features of a Hong Kong tax system, obviously benefit Hong Kong's richer residents, but by concentrating on the rates of tax rather than the real lightness of the burden, commentators have tended to understate the influence of the territory's business interests, or at least they have supported their case with weaker evidence than as in, is in fact available. But it is not only the rich, in fact, it's not even mainly the rich who pay less tax than the rates themselves looked at alone might suggest. About half of Hong Kong's uh, workforce pay no tax on their income at all because of the magnitude of the allowances. Of those who are taxed, an overwhelming majority pay not at the so-called standard rate, 15%, but at progressive rates that produce a lower liability than would be produced by the standard rate. Moreover, there's no goods and services tax, there's no value-added tax, there's no, not even an old-fashioned sales tax. Consequently, a substantial part of the Hong Kong populace pay hardly any tax at all. Now, <clears throat> this, uh, this talk is going to uh, comprise six parts. The, um, the, the first part deals with the introduction of taxes during the Second World War, taxes on income during the Second World War. Basically, what happened was that the colonial government wanted what they thought of as a normal income tax, meaning a single tax on income as such. However, the Chinese business community objected to that, and so what Hong Kong got instead was the same, the strange system of taxation, which is still in force today. Part two of my talk explains how the supposedly temporary wartime taxes were revived after the war by means of the Inland Revenue Ordinance. 1947, it was uh, enacted shortly after the end of the war. Of course, it remains in force today. Part three of my course, uh, of my talk, covers the period from 1947 to 1980. It recounts how the colonial government made three attempts to scrap the supposedly temporary wartime system and to establish what they thought of as a normal income tax in its place. And I explain in this part of the talk how all three of these attempts failed. Part four covers the remainder of the colonial period from 1980 until 1997. By this time, the colonial government had abandoned the original objective, that is, the kind of income tax that the um, British and Hong Kong colonial governments both regarded as normal. And instead, the government started boasting about the successes of the colony's peculiar tax system and its approach to public finances, especially compared to what was going on in the UK at that time. That brings me to part five. Part five um, addresses what has happened since China resumed the exercise of sovereignty over the territory in 1997. The ordinance itself remains structurally unchanged, but there have nonetheless been significant changes since 1997. Um, the basic law came into effect and it enshrined the uh, low tax policy for which Hong Kong has long been famous. Also, shortly after the handover, the SAR government attempted to introduce a GST, a goods and services tax, but that attempt, of course, failed. The SAR government has also established an impressive network of double tax agreements. Um, and finally, the SAR government has repeatedly granted tax cuts and refunds, as I think um, most people watching this talk will um, appreciate. Finally, part six, I will talk about what I think is the secret to the success of uh, Hong Kong's tax system. I examine an aspect of Hong Kong's tax system which is commonly neglected, but which I suggest is crucial to Hong Kong's tax system and also to its successes. This is that the Hong Kong government makes 
very little use, much less used in other countries, of withholding mechanisms. In particular, there is no PAYE in Hong Kong. That is pay as you earn, the withholding of tax on income from employment. No PAYE in Hong Kong. Also, no GST, that is goods and services tax, and no VAT, that is value added tax. Consequently, everyone who's liable for tax in Hong Kong is obliged to pay it themselves. This is of course obvious, but it is more important, I suggest, than is sometimes appreciated, <coughs> and that is what I will attempt to explain. Um, before proceeding, however, I want to draw your attention to something that Adam Smith said long ago in 1776. This is a quote from, uh, from his masterpiece, The Wealth of Nations. What he said was, the middling and superior ranks of people, if they understood their own interest, ought always to oppose all taxes upon the necessaries of life as well as all direct taxes upon the wages of labor. The reason I'm giving you this quote is because it encapsulates the principle upon which the Hong Kong tax system is based and which explains its successes. So, part one, the introduction of taxes on income in Hong Kong during World War II. Um, <coughs> 1939, there's a picture of um, what it looked like. Prior to the Second World War, there were no taxes on income in Hong Kong, but in 1939, the uh, colonial Hong Kong government proposed to introduce a tax on income. The reason they did that was they thought it would be a good idea to make a gift to Britain in support of the war effort. The proposal was from the kind of income tax that the British government regarded as normal. That meant that there would be a single tax on income as such, and this tax would cover both the worldwide incomes of all persons resident in Hong Kong, and it would also cover all income derived from Hong Kong by persons resident elsewhere. The business community predictably objected. The expatriates regarded income tax as inevitable sooner or later, and so they were mainly concerned to ensure that the income tax came later rather than sooner and that the rates of tax would be as low as possible. The Chinese businessmen, however, were uncompromisingly opposed, vehemently opposed to income tax in principle. And the expatriates, sensing that a normal income tax might not be inevitable after all, joined the Chinese in opposing it. The fact that the Chinese business community objected is hardly surprising, especially given that the revenues produced by the tax were to be used to support the British war effort. The government could have used the official majority in the Legislative Council to outvote the unofficials and established a normal income tax, or in fact pass whatever law they wanted, because at that time a majority of the members of the Legislative Council were civil servants, and they always voted with the government. The government, however, was not prepared to use the official majority to outvote the unofficials, and the uh, colonial office in London also would not have approved of that course of action. Instead, what happened was that the governor of the day, Sir Geoffrey Northcote, established a committee. <clears throat> it was dominated by businessmen, and in this way, a deal was done, whereby the businessmen agreed to go along with some sort of an income tax, on condition that the government abdicated the design of this tax to them. There are the, uh, the uh, membership of this 1939 uh, taxation committee. So the first member was Sidney Kane, who was the financial secretary. Um, second member was uh, Low Man Cam, Sir M. K. Low, who was a solicitor and the only Chinese member of the committee. Third was the gloriously named Sir Vandeleur Greyburn, who was the CEO of HSBC. Um, then JJ Patterson, who was the CEO of Jardines, John Fleming, an accountant, and DJ Sloss, who was the Vice uh, Chancellor of uh, Hong Kong U. I've only managed to find um, <coughs> uh, reproducible pictures of three of them, and there they are. That is uh, Sidney Kane on the left, Vandela Greyburn uh, in the middle and DJ Sloss on the right hand side. I think the reason he is looking uh, not especially um, uh, healthy in that photo is because this is shortly after 
um, uh, he was able to return home from Stanley, where I think he spent the course of the war as a um, as prisoner of war. The system that the uh, businessmen came up with was brought into uh, effect by means of legislation called the War Revenue Ordinance 1940. It was called the revenue of the War Revenue Ordinance so as to uh, emphasize uh, that it did not provide for a normal income tax. So it was not called the Income Tax Ordinance, it was called the War Revenue Ordinance, um, partly so as to emphasize that it was not uh, a normal income tax, the system that it established, and also to emphasize that it was a temporary measure to be repealed as soon as the war was over. The uh, system um, of taxation established by the War Revenue Ordinance 1940 differed from a normal income tax in two fundamental respects. First, there was no tax on income as such at all. Instead, there was a scheduler system of three separate taxes. The first was property tax, which was imposed on the rental value of property. The second was salaries tax, which was imposed on income from employment. And the third was profits tax, which was imposed on the profits of business. Secondly, the system was based on the source principle, meaning that tax was only charged on income derived from Hong Kong. Um, <clears throat> income derived from outside Hong Kong, or offshore income, in other words, was not taxable. It's sometimes thought that it might not make much difference whether you have a single tax on income as such, or separate taxes on income of different kinds, but that is not so. The difference is that a single tax on income as such can be charged at very high rates. For example, the British income tax was at one point charged at 98%. A scheduler system can work well enough at low rates of tax, but it simply cannot operate satisfactorily at high or even moderate rates of tax. The reason is that a scheduler tax system <coughs> is inherently inequitable. That term, inherently inequitable, was repeatedly used by the Hong Kong government itself to describe its own tax system. The reason that the scheduler system was inherently inequitable and why it is still inherently inequitable is that if there are separate taxes on different kinds of income, and if those taxes are charged at progressive rates, then a person whose income all comes within a single schedule will pay more tax than one whose income is the same, but split among two or more schedules. If the rates of tax are low, a person might not object to paying more tax than his neighbor, even though their total incomes are the same. But if the rates of tax are increased, the system's inherent inequity will be accentuated with the result that the system will become politically impossible to administer. Whether it would really have become impossible to administer the scheduler tax system if the rates had been substantially increased is impossible to say, because of course, the question was never put to the test. That is, the Hong Kong government has never attempted to increase the rates at which the scheduler taxes are charged to anything uh, anything like the rates to be found in, for example, the United Kingdom. The point remains, however, that both the Hong Kong government and the British government believed that it would be impossible to charge the scheduler taxes at high rates. In any event, the scheduler tax system designed by the businessmen was established by the War Revenue Ordinance 1940. The highest rate of tax was 10%, and the allowances were set at levels that effectively exempted 99% of the population from tax altogether. It was supposed to be a temporary wartime measure. The government's plan to replace it after the war with a normal income tax, that is a single tax imposed on income as such. But of course that never happened. And so the temporary system designed by the businessmen in 1940 remains in force today. The, um, <clears throat> the War Revenue Ordinance 1940 was repealed in 1941 and replaced by the War Revenue Ordinance of that year, 1941. This ordinance kept the basic scheduler structure uh, it introduced the previous year, but it added a new fourth tax to the original three. So we had property tax, salaries tax, profits tax, 
and the new fourth text, which was a text on interest and, of course, is called interest text. It was also at this point that the general anti-avoidance rule was added to the legislation, and as uh, is widely known, that uh, rule has proved a fruitful source of debate and litigation ever since. A few months later, however, uh, Hong Kong was occupied by the Japanese, and the British administration of the territory was suspended. So much for part one of my course talk. I come now to part two. What happened after the war and what happened after the war with the Inland Revenue Ordinance 1947? Um, <clears throat> there's a picture of Hong Kong in 1947, not very different from 1939, very different from today. Um, the reason that the um, legislation that revived the system was, um, was called the Inland Revenue Ordinance is, of course, that, again, it does not provide for a normal income tax. Um, the, the British and Hong Kong governments proposed, as, as in 1939, to establish a normal income tax. And of course, there was no longer any pressing need for military spending. The plan was to spend the revenues for the benefit of the Hong Kong people. The government also planned that the rates of tax should be, quote, as high as possible, unquote. But the Chinese business community, again in uh, 1947, as in 1939 and 1940, were resolutely opposed and unyielding in their opposition to the introduction of any kind of income tax at all, let alone the kind that the British regime considered normal. And so the Chinese business community formed an organization which they called the Chinese Anti-Direct Tax Commission. And they marched in protest on Government House and they wrote letters of complaint to the colonial office in London. And it was as a result of uh, these protests that as a compromise, the scheduler system devised in 1940 was revived in 1947. Uh, the, the, the compromise was essentially that the War Revenue Ordinance um, revived the basic scheduler system that had been introduced as a supposedly temporary measure in 1940. So again, there, were, there was a scheduler system, separate taxes, property tax on the rental value of property, salaries tax on income from employment, profits tax on business profits, and interest tax on interest. And as before, these taxes were all confined to income derived from Hong Kong. In other words, as before, offshore income remained outside the scope of the system. It was supposed to be a temporary measure. The government's plan was uh, that the Inland Revenue Ordinance 1947 would remain in force for one year or possibly two years and then they would repeal it and in its place establish a normal income tax. Of course, that never happened. The only change, <coughs> the only change introduced to the basic structure of the system in 1947 was the introduction of what is called personal assessment, which is like a normal income tax, except that it is elective. So a taxpayer could either pay the scheduler taxes on the several components of his income, or he could elect personal assessment, in which case you would add up those components and pay tax on the total. The aim of personal assessment was to pave the way for a normal income tax. The idea was to set the rates of tax and the allowances at levels such that the overwhelming majority of taxpayers would gain by electing personal assessment. Then it was thought, almost all taxpayers would elect personal assessment, and then it would be possible to um, abolish the scheduler taxes, leaving only personal assessment, and personal assessment would then be compulsory, so that it would constitute a more or less normal income tax, albeit one that would be confined to income derived from Hong Kong. Again, of course, that never happened. Rather, what happened was that personal assessment ameliorated the more serious inequities inherent in the scheduler system. Consequently, personal assessment, far from leading to the abolition of the scheduler taxes, made feasible their preservation. In other words, personal assessment had exactly the opposite effect to what the government had intended. <clears throat> 
I come now to part three. <clears throat> this is the period from 1947 to 1980. And this is characterized by the establishment of three committees. Three committees, each of which had as its basic function the uh, abolition of the scheduler taxes and the establishment in their place of a normal income tax. Again, of course, that is not what happened. The British government from 1947 until about 1980, the British government continued to put pressure on the Hong Kong government to reform the colony's tax system. As before, the basic aim was to establish a normal tax system, that is, a single tax on income as such, including offshore income, and then to crank up the rates of tax. But that never happened for two main reasons. First, the business community, especially the Chinese business community, remained resolutely opposed. Secondly, the Inland Revenue, the Inland Revenue Ordinance immediately demonstrated its one great redeeming virtue. Despite its gross theoretical inadequacy, it almost always, almost miraculously, produced more money than the government wanted to spend. Consequently, although the government effected colossal increases in public spending over these years, it nonetheless almost always found itself operating at a surplus and so it accumulated very substantial reserves. Now, this chapter of uh, Hong Kong's tax history from 1947 to 1980 falls naturally into three periods of about 10 years each. And in each of the three periods, the process of reform was dominated by the financial secretary and the um, committee established um, with a view to re reforming the tax system. So, in the 1950s, the financial secretary was Arthur Clarke, served from 1952 to 1961. In the 1960s, it was Sir John Cowperthwaite, who served in that capacity as financial secretary from 1961 to 1971. And through the 1970s, the financial secretary was Sir Philip Hatton Cave, who occupied that position from 1971 until 1981. Clark, Cowperthwaite and Haddon Cave all thought that it was obvious that what Hong required was a normal income tax, that is, again, a single comprehensive tax covering both the worldwide income, including offshore income, of all persons resident in Hong Kong, and also all income derived from Hong Kong by persons resident elsewhere. In the hope of achieving the goal of a normal income tax, Clark, Cowperthwaite and Haddon Cave each persuaded the governor under whom he served to establish a committee. Um, these were the governors. Sir Alexander Grantham on the left uh, was the governor from 1947 to 1957. Sir David Trench was the uh, governor for a significant part of the 1960s, including when the uh, relevant committee was established. And Sir Murray Maclehose was the uh, governor during the 1970s. And these committees that they established are usually referred to as the first, second, and third Inland Revenue Ordinance Review Committees. All three of them, however, failed to achieve their basic objective of establishing a normal income tax. It was repeatedly alleged throughout this period that the colonial government was acting on instructions from London, and that the idea that Hong Kong should have a normal income tax charged at rates comparable to those in the UK was not devised by the colonial government acting on its own initiative at all, but dictated by Britain. Clark, Cuppethwaite and Haddon Cave all denied that the British government was attempting to dictate tax policy to Hong Kong. It's clear, however, from documents that are now publicly available, that dictating Hong Kong's tax policy was exactly what London was trying to do. In any event, Arthur Clarke's committee, the first Inland Revenue Ordinance Review Committee, was established in 1952 and it supplied its report to the government in 1954. However, this committee, the first review committee, was stymied at the outset. The reason was that the business community persuaded the governor, Sir Alexander Grantham, to draft the committee's terms of reference so narrowly that it was not permitted to consider the possibility of a normal income tax. Consequently, this committee was reduced to recommending a variety of real, relatively trivial technical refinements to the scheduler system. As a result, Clark made no progress at all towards the goal of a normal income tax. And so we come to Sir John 
Cuppethwaite, a towering figure in the history of colonial Hong Kong. Sir John's um, committee, the second Inland Revenue Ordinance Review Committee, suffered the same fate. That is to say, the business community persuaded the governor, Sir David Trench, to draft the terms of reference so narrowly that the committee was not permitted to consider the possibility of a normal income tax. This committee too, therefore, was reduced to recommending a variety of relatively trivial refinements to the scheduler system. Carpathwaite's failure to establish a normal income tax is especially noticeable because he is widely regarded as a, a man who used his control of the government's finances to dictate government policy generally. For example, Frank Welch, who is the author of one of the best general histories of Hong Kong, refers to the 1960s as the Cowperthwaite years. This apparent paradox, however, is easily explained. The proposal for a normal income tax was the only proposal that Cowperthwaite ever made that was seriously contrary to the interests of business. In other words, it seems he could do whatever he liked, so long as he did what business wanted. We come then to Sir Philip Haddon Cave, who served as financial secretary from 1971 to 1981. Um, and, and it was on his watch that the third in the Revenue Ordinance Review Committee was established. It also failed, but its story is a little different. This time, the financial secretary, Sir Philip Haddon Cave, succeeded in getting the governor, Sir Murray Matlows, to appoint a committee with terms of reference sufficiently broad to permit it to consider the possibility of a normal income tax. And the committee duly proposed something resembling a normal income tax. Specifically, the third review committee proposed that there should be a single tax on income as such. Though it also proposed that this tax should be confined to income derived from Hong Kong. In other words, the committee recommended a compromise between the, what the British and Hong Kong colonial governments regarded as a normal income tax and the system designed by the businessmen in 1940. So the idea was, the idea suggested by the third in the Revenue Ordinance Review Committee, was that there should be a single tax on income as such, though it also proposed that this tax should be confined to income derived from Hong Kong. In other words, um, it was a compromise that the government should get something resembling a normal income tax, but offshore income should remain untaxed as before. Having got that far, however, Sir Philip Haddon Cave got no further. The government rejected all of the government's, all of the committee's major recommendations. The government rejected all of the committee's major recommendations. Uh, most importantly, it rejected the proposal that there should be a single tax on income as such, instead of the four scheduler taxes plus personal assessment. The official reason given by the government for not establishing something resembling a normal income tax as recommended by the third review committee was that the Inland Revenue Department had recently purchased a new computer and it was consequently too busy. The department was too busy, it said, to deal with the administrative burden of basic tax reform, quote, at this time. Unquote. Since then, nothing has happened. So the official position seems to be that the reason Hong Kong still has the tax system designed in 1940 is that in the 1970s, the Indian Revenue Department acquired a new computer. This is obviously absurd. The real reason must be that the business community declined to go along with the proposal and the government, as before, shied away from using the official majority to outvote the unofficials. The question arises, therefore, the question arises, why did the government set the committee up at all if it had neither the support of the business community to establish a normal income tax, nor the will to proceed without the support of the business community? The answer seems to be that Maclehos, Sir Murray Maclehos, the governor, and the financial secretary, Sir Philip Haddon Cave, set up the committee knowing that it would fail. And the reason they did that was so that London would stop meddling. Several years earlier, in 1973, Maclehose had wanted to promote Haddon Cave from financial secretary to chief secretary. 
but the British government vetoed the promotion on the grounds that Head and Cave had failed to establish a normal income tax charged at steep progressive rates. Then, in 1976, Maclehose and Head and Cave set up the Third Review Committee, which proposed that there should be a more or less normal income tax. In 1981, Head and Cave was at last promoted from Financial Secretary to Chief Secretary. He had failed to establish a normal income tax, but he apparently had succeeded in satisfying London that he had done all that was feasible. I come to part four. <laughs> this is the modern city-state. There's a, um, a picture of what Hong Kong looked like at the beginning of its, um, it, its uh, period as what we might call the modern city-state. That's the picture of Hong Kong in 1981. Um, the um, financial secretary, Sir Philip Haddon Cave's successor as financial secretary, was Sir John Brembridge. He became financial secretary in 1981, and he served in that capacity until 1986. His appointment was unprecedented in that he was not a career civil servant. Rather, he was a businessman. He was a chairman uh, before his appointment as financial secretary. He was chairman of Swai Pacific, and he was also chairman of Cathay Pacific. There was much speculation at the time as to why the governor, Sir Murray McLehose, had made such an unexpected appointment. The answer seems to be that the businessman had uh, tired after 40 years of financial secretaries attempting to enforce a British-style income tax on them, and they had therefore persuaded the governor to appoint someone who could be relied on to leave the tax system alone. And it was Bremridge's well-known opposition to tax reform that won him the job. In any event, since 1981, the Hong Kong government has never seriously suggested that the territory should have a normal income tax. Also at this point, about 1981, the British government, <coughs> the British government seems to have lost interest in Hong Kong's tax system, though it is difficult to be sure because the public record from this period mostly remains closed. Throughout the 1950s and the 1960s and through most of the 1970s, the British government assumed that the British way of doing things was best and that the Hong Kong should therefore adopt a more British approach to taxation and public spending. By the 1970s, however, it had become obvious that the British approach to taxation and public finance was not working satisfactorily. The British government was seriously in debt and the UK was experiencing very serious economic problems. A turning point, perhaps, came in 1979 when Margaret Thatcher was elected Prime Minister on the basis of a programme of tax cuts, deregulation and privatisation. She was also a great fan of Hong Kong. So the British government ceased to assume that it knew what was best for Hong Kong and started to think that, on the contrary, perhaps the United Kingdom might be able to learn from the colony. Sir John Bremridge was followed by, in turn, Sir Piers Jacobs, Sir Hamish MacLeod and Sir Donald Chun, each of whom served as financial secretary for about five years. So Sir John Bremridge served as financial secretary from 1981 to 1986. Sir Piers Jacobs served as financial secretary from 1986 to 1991. Sir Hamish MacLeod served as financial secretary from 1991 to 1995. And Sir Donald Chung served as financial secretary from 1995 uh, through the handover in 1997 and beyond to 2001. As before, there were no changes in the Hong Kong uh, tax system's basic structure during this period. On the contrary, Bremridge immediately commenced a series of reforms that effectively entrenched the scheduler system. Most importantly, in 1989, Sir Piers Jacobs abolished income tax, uh, interest tax, he abolished interest tax, leaving just the other three scheduler taxes, that is salaries tax, property tax, and profits tax. We come then to the post handover period. <coughs> um, there's a picture of uh, what happened um, on handover day 1997. 
since then, not much has happened in terms of the development of Hong Kong's income tax legislation itself, that is the Inland Revenue Ordinance. The ordinance has been repeatedly amended and the amendments have made it a much more complex piece of legislation than it used to be, but they've not made any difference to its basic scheduler structure. Consequently, Hong Kong still has essentially the same supposedly temporary wartime system of taxation invented in 1940 and revived in 1947. Although the legislation remains structurally unchanged, there have been four developments which, although they don't make any difference to the ordinance itself, nonetheless relate to the basic functioning of the tax system. First is coming into effect of the basic law. Secondly, the SAR government proposed to introduce a value-added tax to be called goods and services tax, or GST. Third, the SAR government uh, adopted almost immediately after the handover a policy of entering into double tax agreements with other governments. And fourthly, the SAR government has repeatedly implemented supposedly one-off tax cuts and refunds. So, <clears throat> a number of provisions in the basic law relate to taxation. The most important of these are those that relate to what is uh, colloquially called the fiscal firewall, secondly, the balanced budget requirement, and thirdly, the low tax policy. The fiscal firewall is the idea that the tax system and public finances of Hong Kong and the mainland should remain completely separate. It is provided for by Articles 106, 108, and also 18. Um, Article 6 provides, as indicated there, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region shall have independent finances. The Hong Kong Special Administrative Region shall use its financial revenues exclusively for its own purposes. They shall not be handed over to the Central People's Government. Central People's Government shall not levy taxes in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region. Also um, relevant to this fiscal firewall are Articles 108 and 18. Article 108 says, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region shall practice an independent taxation system. And Article 18 says, national laws shall not be applied in the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region except those listed in Annex 3. And if you look at Annex 3 to the basic law, what you will see is that the uh, laws listed there do not include any tax statutes. Very unusual, uh, possibly unique for a uh, national government, such as the uh, government of China, to categorically exclude part of its territory from having to contribute to the national finances. Nonetheless, the fiscal firewall seems to have operated very smoothly and to have caused no problems at all. Next, balancing the budget. Article uh, 107 <coughs> of the uh, basic law provides, as said out there, the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region shall follow the principle of keeping expenditure within the limits of revenue in drawing up its budget and strive to achieve a fiscal balance, avoid deficits, and keep the budget commensurate with the growth rate of its gross domestic product. The desirability of constitutional balanced budget requirements has long been a matter of considerable interest in many parts of the world, notably the United States at both federal and state level. Article 107 thus demonstrates one method by which it has been done. It's necessary to note, though, that Article 107 allows considerable flexibility. It does not require that the SAR government actually balance its budgets, but only that it strive to do so. Similarly, it does not require that the SAR government actually keep expenditure within the limits of revenue, but only that it follow the principle of doing so. What this means is obviously debatable. Most commentators, for example, Professor Yash Guy, Professor Andrew Halkyard, and Professor Richard Cullen, take the view that the Hong Kong courts, if asked, will probably conclude that Article 107 is not justiciable but merely symbolic. In other words, no one will be able to obtain a remedy through the courts if the government fails to balance its budgets. But even if Article 107, even if Article 107 is merely symbolic, the symbolism is powerful, as is evidenced by the fact that debates 
on how the SAR government might best respond to its occasional budgetary difficulties have made repeated reference to it. Thirdly, the low tax policy, which is provided for by Article 108 of the Basic Law, which is worded in part as follows. The Hong Kong Special Administrative Region shall, taking the low tax policy previously pursued in Hong Kong as reference, enact laws on its own concerning types of taxes, tax rates, tax reductions, allowances and exemptions, and other matters of taxation. This raises a number of questions. First, what exactly is the low tax policy? How low is low? Secondly, as with the uh, previous articles I've mentioned, is Article 108 justiciable or is it merely symbolic? What would happen if the Hong Kong government were for some reason to enact a law imposing a tax that was not in accordance with the low tax policy? Would it be unconstitutional and therefore void? Would it be lawful for people to refuse to pay the tax on the basis that it was not in accordance with the basic law? And thirdly, who would get to decide? Would it be the Court of Final Appeal in Hong Kong or would it be a matter of interpretation of the Standing Committee of the National People's Congress? Again, however, most commentators take the view that Article 108 is not justiciable, but merely symbolic. Next up, <clears throat> the um, proposal to introduce GST. GST uh, is uh, initial standing for goods and services tax. Um, the name for more or less the identical tax in some parts of the world is value-added tax, commonly abbreviated to VAT. But goods and services tax and value-added tax are the same thing. So GST and VAT are the same thing. Um, which label you prefer is mainly a matter of taste. They, they both have some advantages. They both also have some disadvantages. In the late 1980s, the financial secretary, Sir Piers Jacobs, attempted to introduce a sales tax. His idea was partly that the new tax would stabilise the government's rather volatile revenues and also that it would make possible substantial cuts in the rates of tax on income, that is, the, the uh, scheduler tax is provided for the Inland Revenue Ordinance. However, nothing came of uh, Piers Jacobs' proposal, mainly because it was opposed not only by the majority of Hong Kong people, but also by the business community. This is intriguing because... In many other countries, business interests have typically been in favour of sales taxes and other indirect taxes because they see them as a means of shifting a substantial part of the onto ordinary working people, thus making it possible to cut the taxes on business profits and on large personal incomes. But be that as it may, nothing came of Jacob's proposal. Shortly after the handover, however, the SAR government decided to introduce a goods and services tax, or GST. As I said, that means essentially the same kind of tax that in some countries is referred to as value-added tax, or VAT. So the Hong Kong proposal was referred to as goods and services tax, or GST, which is the name used uh, where I am at the moment, which is New Zealand, also Australia and Singapore call it uh, GST, Canada likewise. Uh, most European countries refer to it as the value added tax or VAT. Um, <clears throat> the SAR government's aim in proposing GST was to use the new tax as a means of financing substantial cuts in the taxes on income, that is, the taxes provided for by the Inland Revenue Ordinance. This proposal, too, has so far come to nothing, and for the same reason, that is, it was opposed by the business community. Whether the government ever revives this plan, of course, remains to be seen. Now, the third post-handover trend is the SAR government's new policy of entering into double tax agreements, or DTAs. So far, it has entered into DTAs with 45 countries and is negotiating with about another dozen. This is, I think, an unprecedented um, uh, achievement in achieving such a comprehensive network of double tax agreements. Many uh, other countries in the world have double tax agreements, but uh, very few of them, I think, possibly none of the others, have managed to put together uh, such a comprehensive network of treaties so speedily. <coughs> uh, you'll see if you read those countries there, those are the countries with which uh, Hong Kong has entered into double tax agreements. And if you look through that list, you'll see that the territory has succeeded in entering into DTAs, 
with almost all countries of real economic significance to, uh, to the SAR, with the sole major exception of the United States. One reason that the SAR government adopted this policy of entering into DTAs with as many uh, countries as possible um, is that as the years have gone by, the larger OECD countries, the US, the Western European countries, Japan, and so on, have become increasingly concerned about the various jurisdictions in the world that function as tax havens. That is, they make it possible for people living in OECD countries to avoid or evade the taxes that they should be paying there. In the mid-1990s, the OECD became serious about shutting down the tax havens of the world, and it launched a campaign against them. To this end, the OECD countries have put tremendous pressure on the governments of other countries to agree to hand over information about taxpayers. And so the Hong Kong SAR government, like governments elsewhere, came under pressure to hand over information about taxpayers. So in order for Hong Kong to continue to be regarded as a good global citizen, it became necessary for the SAR government to appear at least to be willing to enter into treaties providing for what they call information exchange. And so the Hong Kong government, attempting to extract some benefit from this situation, seems to have adopted the position that it is prepared to provide information to any government that in return is prepared to grant relief from withholding taxes imposed on dividends, royalties and interest, and also in some circumstances to exempt business profits from tax. Hong Kong's double tax agreements are all based on a standard form double tax treaty produced by the OECD, which is called the Model Tax Treaty. Um, for present purposes, the model treaty has three important provisions, and these are all incorporated, I think, in all of, um, of uh, Hong Kong's 45 DTAs, all of which are based on the model. First, the model treaty provides for what is called information exchange. That is, in various circumstances, the governments that are party to the treaty are obliged to provide information about taxpayers to other governments. Secondly, the model treaty provides also for reduced rates of withholding tax on dividends and interest and for zero withholding tax on royalties. Thirdly, last but not least, uh, the model treaty provides that business profits are not taxable at all unless the taxpayer has a permanent establishment in the taxing jurisdiction. Therefore, the effect of Hong Kong's double tax agreements is that Hong Kong companies' offshore profits are not taxed in the country from which they are derived, so long as, that as, long as the company does not have what is called a permanent establishment in that country. Also, dividends, interest and royalties derived from other countries are subject to reduced rates of withholding tax or to no withholding tax at all. The government's... <coughs> of some OECD countries were initially reluctant to enter into DTAs with Hong Kong. The reason was that the effect of a standard form DTA with Hong Kong was typically and is typically not merely to save cross-border trade and investment from being taxed twice, but to prevent it from being taxed at all. The Hong Kong government's success in getting 45 countries so far and more coming soon to enter into DTAs is therefore especially impressive. The main effect of Hong Kong's network of DTAs as a result is that it enables the territory to function as an even better tax haven than before. Uh, the fourth change that the SAR government has made um, is that it's repeatedly enacted tax cuts. And the reason that it has done that is simply apparently that it did not need the money. Um, the reason that these cuts are mostly supposedly one off is presumably that the government does not want to commit itself to permanent tax cuts because that might be hard to reverse. Now, um, part six of what I have to say. So that brings us pretty much up to date. And what I want to talk about now is what seems to me the secret to Hong Kong's success, the secret to the success of Hong Kong's tax system and Hong Kong's approach to public finance. Now, um, an important aspect of most developed countries' tax systems is that tax is collected 
by means of withholding. In particular, it is collected by means of PAYE and GST. PAYE is pay as you earn, which means uh, withholding tax on income from employment. In other words, the tax on employment income is not paid by the employee at all, but by the employer. The employer withholds the tax from the employee's salary and pays it to the government, paying to the employee only what is left over. In Hong Kong, in contrast, there is no PAYE. Instead, people in employment, if they're liable for tax, they're obliged to pay it themselves. The lack of PAYE in Hong Kong is usually looked on as no more than an administrative curiosity. In fact, however, it's crucial. The reason is that other countries' heavy taxes are viable only because they are collected from the employer rather than from the employee. In the rest of the developed world, if the government were to abolish PAYE and taxpayers were required to pay their tax themselves, the result would be that a very large number of them would fail to pay. In order to collect a tax, the government would have to sue the defaulters, which would be expensive. Many would turn out not to have any assets, so getting a judgment against them would be futile. Worse, the political cost of dragging otherwise law-abiding citizens through the courts would be colossal. In short, the consequence of abolishing PAYE in most developed countries would be chaos. Hong Kong, however, manages very well without it, no PAYE. The reasons for this are obvious. Saving to pay Hong Kong's light taxes is relatively easy. Also, almost all of those who are obliged to pay are worth suing if they fail to pay. But the fact that, the Hong, Kong, that, the fact that Hong Kong has no PAYE gives the Hong Kong government a kind of legitimacy that cannot be claimed by the governments of most other developed jurisdictions. For surely a government that can rely on taxpayers' active compliance is in a sense more legitimate than one whose finances would be reduced to chaos if they tried to do the same. PAYE also has an important but underappreciated psychological effect. It functions as an anesthetic. It dulls the pain of paying tax, but it also dulls the mind. <laughs> In Hong Kong, most taxpayers seem to have a reasonably accurate idea of how much tax they pay, because they pay it themselves, and the experience sticks in the mind. In the rest of the developed world, in contrast, PAYE deprives the large majority of the population for this, of this opportunity for, for reflection. They tend, in the rest of the world, to think of their income in terms of after-tax income or take-home pay. And mostly, they have very little idea of how much tax they pay. Many do not even notice how much tax has been withheld by their employer. And even if they do notice, noticing how much has been withheld by your employer is a very different experience from making the payment yourself. An interesting experiment that you can try is ask people if they know how much tax they pay. You don't have to ask them how much they paid. They can, they can keep that confidential, but just ask them if they know. And uh, the answer that you get um, will depend on where you ask them. If you ask people in Hong Kong, then they tend to know the answer, um, obviously, because they paid it themselves. If you ask people in countries where tax is collected by PAYE, I think you will find that you get different answers depending on whether the person you ask is an employee or self-employed. If they're self-employed, then they generally, they generally know the answer. They know how much tax they pay because just as in Hong Kong, they have to pay it themselves. But if you ask someone whose tax has been collected by PAYE, how much tax they paid, they commonly have no idea. The, um, the psycho psychological impact of PAYE can be seen in the fact that in many, uh, in most developed countries, many taxpayers receive a refund. And when they receive their refund, these taxpayers are usually pleased. They are happy about the fact that they receive a refund. This is obviously irrational because the only reason they got a refund is that their employer withheld more tax than they're actually obliged to pay. So the government had the use of their money, for which it usually doesn't pay any interest, or if it does, the interest is at a, a um, below a commercial rate. 
<clears throat> now, next point, GST. Similarly, the governments of most developed countries rely heavily on GST, or if you like, VAT, value-added tax. GST and value-added tax are, are a tax on consumers, but it's a withholding tax in the sense that although the burden is supposed to fall on consumers, the tax is collected from suppliers of goods and services, that is, generally speaking, from businesses. The reason this, that for this, the way it works, is, of course, that suppliers generally increase their prices so as to cover the amount of the tax. As with PAYE, GST is, in a sense, a painless tax because consumers tend to forget that the price of the goods and services includes the amount of the tax. Again, if you're in a country that has one of these taxes, a GST or a VAT, if you ask people how much GST or VAT they paid last year, mostly they haven't got a clue. In this respect, too, the Hong Kong tax system has a kind of legitimacy that most other jurisdictions cannot claim. Some people in Hong Kong, brash young capitalists and uh, most accountants, think that using PAYE and GST as a means of shifting some of the burden of taxation onto ordinary working people in Hong Kong would be a good idea. Other people, wise old capitalists, realise that if the poor people are made to pay tax, they will demand something in return, such as, in particular, increased public spending. Now, it's possible that increased public spending is exactly what Hong Kong needs. But even if that is the case, it might be unwise to whip up demand for it by imposing provocatively regressive taxes on ordinary working Hong Kong people. Prior to the Second World War, most, um, most countries' income taxes, like Hong Kong's, were only imposed on people who were relatively affluent. But in many, many countries, PAYE was introduced in the course of the Second World War or soon afterwards as a means of converting the income tax into a mass tax imposed on almost everybody who had a job. It was the introduction of PAYE that was a necessary step towards massive increases in public spending. This is true, too, of GST. Everywhere there is a GST, everywhere there is a VAT, there is an inexorable tendency for public spending to increase. Everywhere there's a GST, everywhere there's a VAT, the government, when it introduced a tax, promised that once the tax was introduced, the rate of tax would remain unchanged. Everywhere there is a GST, everywhere there is a VAT, the government has broken that promise. Now, Adam Smith again. I'll return to what he said nearly 250 years ago. <clears throat> he said, the middling and superior ranks of people, if they understood their own interest, ought always to oppose all taxes upon the necessaries of life, as well as all direct taxes upon the wages of labour. In Hong Kong, there are no taxes on the necessaries of life, and there are no taxes on the wages of labour, and the middling and superior ranks of people have obviously done all right for themselves. There is, of course, a tax on salaries, but salaries tax is well named. It's generally only charged on incomes that are large enough to be sensibly classified as salaries. Mere wages are usually exempt. So I'm gonna conclude now the central question presented by Hong Kong's tax history is whether the system designed by a group of businessmen in wartime haste 80 years ago is adequate to meet the needs of modern Hong Kong. For about 40 years from 1940 until 1980, the Hong Kong government itself regarded the territory's tax system as woefully inadequate. In about 1980, however, if not before, the government abandoned its plan to scrap the scheduler system of taxation provided for by the Inland Revenue Ordinance and establish a normal income tax in its place. Similarly, most Hong Kong people seem to be relatively content with the territory's tax system. But the question is not susceptible to a purely technical answer. Rather, what is required is an answer that is both technically sound and politically acceptable. It's true that Hong Kong's tax system is grossly inadequate when judged by the standards of the rest of the world. It's also true, however, that that matters not at all if the Hong Kong people like it the way it is. The only criterion that really matters is what do the Hong Kong people want? As for the rest of the world, Hong Kong's fiscal successes are so impressive it seems unlikely that nothing can be learned from. The territory is often cited as evidence on the merits of extremely light taxation, but on its own that is simplistic, trite and unhelpful. Hong Kong's real achievement is not merely that the burden of taxation is very light, 
but that the combination of light taxes and low public spending are so structured as apparently to enjoy an impressively high level of popular support. And the key, I suggest, to Hong Kong's successes seems to be twofold. First, the burden of taxation, although much lighter than in other places, is very heavily concentrated on large incomes. Secondly, the Hong Kong government, unlike most other governments, makes almost no use of withholding mechanisms. In particular, there's no PAYE, there's no VAT, there's no GST. Thank you, that is all I wish to say, but uh, whatever questions you may have, I will do my best to attempt to answer them. Thank you very much, Michael. This was a great presentation and very enlightening and uh, interesting. Um, if anybody has questions, as mentioned before, please chat them in. I will read them out and Professor Littlewood. Thank you very much. Uh, next question from my colleague, uh, Noam Nov. Um, Singapore's tax system, which has GST and a PayYE equivalent system, achieves a similar low and successful tax system, but without relying on land revenue and creating the most unaffordable real estate market in the world. <laughs> what, lessons, what lessons can Hong Kong learn from Singapore? Um, I think, yeah, certainly that, that is true, is that I, I very much glossed over what I think the questioner identifies is a, a crucial aspect of the, um, the Hong Kong government's finances, <coughs> excuse me, which is, which is the, the, the colossal uh, uh, price of land in Hong Kong is effectively an implicit tax. And it, and it is probably passed on to the, community, the, uh, the Hong Kong population generally in terms of um, uh, the, the price of land is, is probably passed on in the form of higher prices to everybody who lives in Hong Kong. And this is, and it is probably a quite seriously regressive tax. So I think certainly um, something that Hong Kong could learn from Singapore is that, that this, this, this is a, on the whole, it's, it's a nice, comfortable source of revenue for the Hong Kong government, but it is an undesirable thing because it is, it is deeply inequitable and um, because of its regressivity. And it would be nice if the Hong Kong government were to make some attempt to reduce its reliance on land revenue Though I have to say, I am um, not very optimistic that that is very, very likely to happen. Thank you. And also, it will encourage more investment because, for example, British firms can invest in Australia without paying tax anywhere, and that is likely to attract investment into Australia. And not only that, but they get information exchange as well. So the only two real holdouts now are the US and Germany. Sorry again for omitting Germany. Uh, next question, why did personal assessment not have its intended, intended effect? The, 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 the objective was that personal assessment would function as a more or less normal income tax, but it would be confined to income derived from Hong Kong. And they, they structured the rates of tax and the allowances in such a way that a large majority of taxpayers uh, benefited by electing personal assessment because they then pay less tax. And so what they thought was that by, the, by, by uh, taking that course of action, eventually what would happen is that a large majority of taxpayers, overwhelming majority of taxpayers, would elect personal assessment, and then the political cost of abolishing the scheduler taxes, uh, property tax and salaries tax and uh, profits tax and interest tax, um, would, would be sustainable. However, it turned out that what happened was that uh, personal assessment made the, the, um, the inherent inequity of the scheduler taxes less pronounced because in circumstances where the scheduler taxes produced a, 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 a seriously inequitable consequence, the taxpayer would elect personal assessment and that would reduce the, um, the scale of the problem. <laughs> um, and, and for that reason, um, the, um, it, it became difficult to, to abolish the, the scheduler taxes, particularly since, obviously, as you'd expect, the business community continued to oppose that course of action. Thank you. Uh, next, con the next que two questions concern offshore uh, income. Uh, Hong Kong doesn't test tax uh, offshore income, and that was introduced, I think, in the 1940s. You said in 1940, actually, with the 
uh, war revenue ordinance, correct? What was, the, what was the original rationale behind this and why was that kept? And a follow-up question, um, how to define offshore income in so far as profits tax is concerned? Uh, the, the original rationale for exempting offshore income from tax <clears throat> was that there was a theoretical justification was given for this at, in 1940 by the businessmen who invented the system. But the justification they gave was, uh, was so weak that obviously nobody would take it seriously. The, the explanation was this. The explanation was <coughs> that uh, some Hong Kong companies had shareholders who were resident in the UK. And the shareholders who were resident in the UK, shareholders of Hong Kong companies, if a Hong Kong company made a profit, then the, uh, the Hong Kong company might pay a dividend to the shareholders, including the shareholders in the UK. And the shareholders in the UK uh, would then have to pay tax in the UK on the dividend that they received. And, um, and in, in calculating the British tax payable on the dividend, the British tax system would have allowed uh, a credit or some other relief for the tax paid in Hong Kong on the company's profits, including the profits made from outside Hong Kong. And therefore, the businessman said, since there's going to be relief in the UK anyway, there's no point in, in uh, Hong Kong uh, companies having to pay Hong Kong tax on their offshore profits. Now, obviously, that just doesn't make sense. However, uh, the, um, the, uh, the government at the time was so desperate to get an income tax and so uh, reluctant to use the official majority to outvote the unofficials in the Legislative Council that they accepted that, even though it makes no sense. Um, what was the other, the other part of the question about how to define uh, the distinction between offshore taxable Hong Kong profits? Offshore income in so far as profits tax is concerned. <laughs> uh, well, as, as I think the person who asked that question knows, there, there's a long, long series of, um, of um, court cases uh, drawing that distinction. The, the drafting of the legislation remains uh, almost exactly as it has always been um, uh, since the wartime taxes. Um, so the, the, the wording used is, is uh, profits arising in or derived from Hong Kong. And what that means is a long line of, of cases um, um, establishing what that means. Thank you. Uh, estate duty and wealth tax were not mentioned in your talk. Do you think Hong Kong should revive <laughs> estate tax slash inheritance tax? Um, well, I, I, would, I would say before answering that question, I would say in the, in the hope that there are some uh, legal historians paying attention to this, that would be a most excellent topic for somebody to research because, yes, I, 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 I um, wrote my book about the history of income tax, and that was a big enough project for one book, although, as the questioner says, I neglected to say uh, very much at all about Hong Kong's other taxes, in particular uh, stamp duty and estate duty. Um, um, Hong Kong still has stamp duty. In fact, Hong Kong government is more reliant on stamp duty than just about any other government in the world, I think. Um, and as for estate duty, the, um, there has been a bit of a global trend for governments to rely less and less on estate duty. Estate duty is a form of death tax. Um, in, 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 in one sense, death taxes are a very good form of tax because obviously once you...